Happy spring. We're out in the vestibule. <laughs> it's cold out here still. I think it's only about 50 degrees. And it's been really nice. We've worked ourselves tired. <laughs> and so tired I got a cold sore. And I'm pointing that out to you because I'm really self-conscious about it. <laughs> but we uh, have been working quite a bit. And that's part of the wind's been blowing back and forth. It's a time of season where the wind blows from the north, blows from the south. But at least and it's a, going to lot. win. The good side's going to win over old man winter. And a lot of wind, like, not a breeze, like wind, yep. where it exhausts you when you're out in it. But to get to the point, we just wanted to <laughs> encourage everyone to uh, observe the memorial of Jesus' death. Uh, of course, there's a lot of videos out there that talk about, you know, the memorial. But we just wanted to put a reminder out there, as we've done, I think, the last couple of times, that if you've missed it, there is a provision to where you can observe it next month if for some reason, like I said, you've missed it. This, you know, we've said before, this doesn't have to be a major ordeal. Jesus made the occasion simple for a reason. You know, a little flour, um, a little bit of water mixed into a simple dough, baked at 450 for 15 minutes with a little, you know, a few holes in it and a glass of wine, preferably without additives, which there are several varieties. Um, you can look it up online if you have the internet for the list for that. And we also have to remember that there was no doubt many different herbs and spices available to the Israelites. Um, in fact, some of them were used solely for the purpose of worship. But, some mixtures. Exactly. But here Jesus chose the customarily used unadulterated unleavened bread. So no extra additives, no yeast, no spices, no salt. And that's fitting because it represents his sinless body and blood. So we're going to do this in sort of a return to the breakfast soapbox format. <laughs> but uh, so it's going to be kind of matter of fact. But by definition, a memorial is a remembrance of, well, in this case, someone's death. A memorial can be of anything, but in this case, it's of Jesus Christ's death. And of course, there are a lot of opinions on how to observe the memorial. My God. Relax. Do you need some wine? I guess. <laughs> Ready? Now, of course, there are a lot of opinions on how to observe the memorial. Uh, the first seems to revolve around when. In fact, one of the verses given by some to observe the memorial more than once a year is 1 Corinthians 11.26. And maybe we can have Tiffany read that. And okay. we'll be using the silver bullet or silver sword, if you prefer. For whenever you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. So it says whenever there, but some translations render that as often as, as you often do. as you do. Yeah, I think if I remember right. Yeah, and it's funny because we hear so many apostates say, well, the Bible says this or it says that and that's not right. But we have to remember that the Bible is most often just pointing out wrongs in an attempt to correct in a small measure. Right. We do see that over and over again in the Bible. It's sort of like when Jesus was being questioned about marriage and not divorcing. And the Pharisees asked, well, then why did Moses issue a certificate of divorce? And Jesus basically tells them, well, it's because of your hard-heartedness. In other words, he didn't really approve of it, but he just tried to regulate it in an attempt to provide at least some protection for the victim. And, of course, the Pharisees manipulated that law, too. There was always a way around the law if you're just focusing on the law. It's really the difference between law and principle, or legalism and the spirit of the law. But that's the case here in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul was just briefly addressing a woefully wayward congregation, as we read in verse 17. But while giving these instructions, I do not commend you, because it is not for the better, but for the worse that you meet together. For first of all, I hear that when you come together in a congregation, divisions exist among you, and to an extent I believe it. For there will certainly also be sex among you, so that those of you who are approved may also become evident. When you come together in one place, it is not really to eat the Lord's evening meal, for when you eat it, each one takes his own evening meal beforehand, so that one is hungry, but another is intoxicated. Do you not have houses for eating and drinking, or do you despise the congregation of God and make those who have nothing feel ashamed? 
What can I say to you? Should I commend you? In this, I do not commend you. So there are a couple of things here that are pretty interesting. First off, right off the bat, we see it's for the worse that they're meeting together. I mean, ouch, what horrible thing can you say? That Hebrews says that the whole purpose of gathering together is to incite to love and fine works. Well, here, as Tiffany read, they're like shaming one another. You have to remember, the customary way to do Passover, for example, was for you to come to Jerusalem with your sacrifice and all you needed for it, and, and you'd eat with your family probably. And they were continuing this, which made the ones who were had nothing feel ashamed. Feel ashamed. And, and there's, like Tiffany mentioned earlier on, there's a reason why it was so simple. So it's for the worse that they meet together. You're not inciting to love and fine works. It'd be better off if you'd not met at all. I mean, that's horrible. Ouch. Second, again, he mentions divisions, which takes us back to chapter one, where he's talking about following men. And I think that starts in verse 10 and goes through 13, and where he says that Apollos wasn't baptized for you. Was Paul baptized for you? Was the governing body baptized for you? Yeah, yeah. You see, the whole point is, is that this division or this following of men caused a division. And third, we see that that following men leads to sectarianism. And that it also brings about a sort of wheat in the weeds scenario where that actually manifests those who are approved. So the point is, this is a congregation that is way off track. In this chapter alone, verse 11, or chapter 11, it mentions headship, the memorial, perhaps drunkenness, certainly lack of consideration for their brothers. And when considering the rest of the letter, the scripture says that it, if you're unrighteous in least, you'll also be unrighteous in much. And we can certainly see that's true because in chapter 5, we're talking about a situation where a guy's sleeping with his stepmother. I mean, things that the scripture says not even the world, the world does. <laughs> so this isn't extensive instructions or anything. As Paul says in the end of verse 34, you don't have to read that there, but these are just a few things to bump them in the right direction until he gets there. But back to the point in verse 26 and the statement of as often as you drink it or eat it and drink it. It helps if we just continue where we left off in verse 23. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night on which he was going to be betrayed took a loaf and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This means my body, which is in your behalf. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. He did the same with the cup also, after they had the evening meal, saying, This cup means the new covenant by virtue of my blood. Keep doing this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. So whenever again, or however often you do this. But we see there in verse 23, when we started off, that the tradition that Paul says was handed to him from the Lord was on the night when he was to be handed over. Yeah, for us, we take this to mean this observance the Lord instituted is to be held on the night which he was handed over. So as an annual observance. And just speaking in general of major observances around the world, I mean, how often is Christmas? Easter. Uh, Independence Day, or I think the 4th of July. Thanksgiving. Valentine's Day. St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Let's get off track here uh, on this different tangent. How about Mecca? Hanukkah. <laughs> so obviously we could just go on and on and on with all the most important observances to people that are held annually. But speaking of the memorial of Christ Jesus, what night did he institute the memorial observance on? Passover. And how often was Passover held then? And I still think even is today. Once a year. Yeah. Moreover, what was eaten at Passover? Lamb, bitter greens, unfermented cakes, or unleavened bread. Yeah. And uh, there's some interesting points mentioned in Numbers, too, if we read that. Um, okay, where do you where want they me institute to be? that? Let's go to uh, Numbers okay. and uh, 9. Verse what? And start one. Verse 1. 
Jehovah spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, The Israelites should prepare the Passover sacrifice at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month at twilight, you should prepare it at its appointed time. According to all its statutes and all its set procedures, you should prepare it. So it mentions there, according to all its statutes, you read through three, right? I did. Yeah, okay. But if we turn back, let's just pause there and go to Exodus in chapter 12. We'll see the statutes. So what's it talking about as far as according to the statutes? 12 what? Uh, verse uh, 8. 8. I've got notes up here, so I'm not that smart. They must eat the meat on this night. They should roast it over the fire and eat it along with unleavened bread and bitter greens. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, its head together with its shanks and its inner parts. How long should I read for? Uh, go through 11. You must not save any of it until morning, but any of it left over until morning you should burn with fire. And this is how you should eat it, with your belt fastened, sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you should eat it in a hurry. It is Jehovah's Passover. So we see some instructions there on how to prepare it. And also even, uh, you know, that none of it was to be left over morning. It reminds me of kind of a, yeah. what was the situation with Jesus on the stake? He couldn't be there. He, they always took the criminals down before Passover ended. Yep, exactly. And even it was supposed to be eaten with your staff in your hand. In a hurry. In a hurry. Yeah. So let's go back now, since we got those statutes down. That's the statutes it's talking about in Numbers. So if we go back to Numbers 3, um, verse three. 4. You can read 3 again if you want, but that's where we left off. Okay, verse 4 says, So Moses told the Israelites to prepare the Passover sacrifice. Then they prepared the Passover sacrifice in the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that Jehovah had commanded Moses, so the Israelites did. Now there were men who would become unclean by touching a dead body, so that they were not able to prepare the Passover sacrifice on that day. So this is where we talked about earlier. We were going to come back to the provision in the scriptures to where you can uh, do the memorial uh, later. later, a month later. So this situation arises. So verse um, 6 so those men presented themselves before Moses and Aaron on that day and said to him, We are unclean because of touching a dead body. Why should we be kept from presenting the offering to Jehovah at its appointed time among the Israelites? At this Moses said to them, Wait there and let me hear what Jehovah may command regarding you. Then Jehovah said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, Although any man among you or of your future generations should become unclean by touching a dead body, or should be off on a distant journey, he must still prepare the Passover sacrifice to Jehovah. They should prepare it in the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight. They should eat it together with unleavened bread and bitter greens. They must not let any of it remain until morning, and they should not break any bone in it. They should prepare it according to every statute regarding the Passover. So we see there that they had to do the Passover as the law stipulated still. We meant we saw that they mentioned not only that the uh, shouldn't remain till morning, but also the breaking of the bones. Right. We think about Jesus and, and how he was executed and how normally they broke the bones on the legs of those being executed just to make them die faster. So, in fact, they could take them down before the yeah. day ended. Right. So, uh, an interesting tidbits there as far as that goes. But again, even if they were on a way of a journey, the scripture said, or if they would touched a dead body, they still needed to perform that in Jerusalem. Even though it wasn't a uh, uh, communion sacrifice, it still needed to be held in Jerusalem. Which is why that whole situation at Pentecost was needed, you know, when they were preaching to all these nationalities after Jesus died. Right, right. But we can see here that everybody in the city had to observe the Passover and eat the lamb, the greens, and the bread according to the statutes. There was one statute for all who lived in that physical city, for a remembrance of when the angel passed over their houses, as long as there was blood on their doorposts, whether they were Israelites or Egyptians, whether they were a worshiper of God or not. As it said, even those who were a great mixed company came out of it. So does that mean... All must partake of Christ's memorial or be cut off? 
First, we have to realize that the law was a shadow of the reality. And though it did have some flexibility in it, like we talked about with the men that were on uh, a journey. Had circumstances. Yep. For the most part, it was rigid. And even in that circumstance, they had to make another law for to a, an addendum or a, an amendment, you might say, to the law. And, and that really led to a legalistic view. Paul even compares the law to the veil that Moses wore that made it impossible for the Israelites to see the glory of God. And the Pharisees were masters at elevating that veil and focusing on the veil itself instead of trying to lift the veil to see the glory of God. So whenever we read the law looking for insight, we want to be really careful about getting too legalistic. For example, the scriptures say that Jesus reclined at the meal to eat with his apostles at leisure. Yet we just read in the instructions in the law that they were supposed to eat standing, staff in hand, and in haste, or as you mentioned, in a hurry. hurry. So just as with observing the Sabbath, Jesus was not legalistic in following the law. He always lifted the veil to see the spirit behind the law. Okay, so we don't want to become legalistic, but still, since everyone had to partake of the Passover... Did that mean that everyone must partake of the bread and the wine at Jesus' memorial? Because some quote John 6.53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. You're right. Some take that to mean unless you actually eat the flesh and drink the blood, you have no salvation. Millions, in fact, go to take that literally in what is called transubstantiation where the bread and the wine actually become Jesus' flesh and blood once they eat it. I remember once I was having a discussion with a very intelligent woman who was actually an English teacher, who happened to be a Catholic, and you were there on that call, if I recall. I was there, yep. You were on the call, if I recall. I was, yes, I was with you on that return visit call, yes. <laughs> and, we rem- and as I remember, we were having a pretty good conversation that was extremely reasonable until the conversation somehow turned to transubstantiation, wherein she, how how did that go? Do you remember what she said? Well, I think she called you stupid. (laughs) I get that a lot. I don't know what the deal is with (laughs) that. She said, she said something like, you know, like you don't know anything if you don't believe that the wine and bread actually become Jesus flesh and blood after communion. (laughs) Now, perhaps somebody uh, more gracious than myself would have excused themselves from the conversation at this point. But given that her daughter was sitting just in the other room and eavesdropping, I chose to respond. You're an English teacher. Explain to me what similes and metaphors are. And I could see, like, the gears turning in her head, so I continued. I tell you what, to help me have the same faith as you regarding this subject, After you take communion, go have an immediate surgery to remove the bread and the wine. And if they are actually human flesh and blood, not only will I pay for the surgery, but I will immediately convert to Catholicism. And all of a sudden, our English teacher became reasonable again. (laughs) Yeah, she said, well, obviously the bread and the wine don't actually become Jesus' flesh and blood. <laughs> and again, we saw her, her, da- her daughter peeking around the corner. <laughs> she, her daughter was a high school age. <laughs> yeah. But to help with avoiding an extreme view of partaking, a similar consideration might be drawn from the baptism account in 1 Peter. So if we go to 1 Peter... And uh, you know where that's at, I'm sure. I Chapter 3, yep. and we're going to read 21. It says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, is also now saving you, not by the removing of the filth of the flesh, but by the request to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some religions take this to mean that in order to have salvation, one has to be baptized. And they'll go so far as to role play as if they were the various dead individuals that weren't baptized. And then they get baptized for that person that's dead in their behalf. Really, even if it's against their will. All because baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, obviously, this is an extreme view. But can you think of anyone that was approved by God in the Christian era? And even though they weren't baptized, 
Well, Cornelius. Right, exactly. They, Acts 10 tells us that Peter was taught his legalistic view of God's approval was not really correct. And Holy Spirit showed that not only Cornelius, but also his entire household that met there were approved, though they were not baptized. It's as 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism, as a physical act, does nothing in and of itself. Physically washing away dirt, it really does nothing for us spiritually. And even if one wanted to take this verse and consider it spiritually, like you know, a spiritual man considers all things, the putting away of the works of the flesh does nothing in and of itself. Or in other words, just being a good person isn't enough. It's faith in salvation through Jesus. So salvation isn't through works. Likewise, we're not saved by baptism itself. So are we saying that there's no need for baptism? No. no. Works will follow. Because we know that even Cornelius and his household got baptized. But it wasn't a prerequisite for God's approval. Imagine if one of them happened to die after receiving Holy Spirit, but before baptism. Can you imagine that they wouldn't get salvation? No, they were approved by Holy Spirit. Exactly. In fact, it was Peter that actually pushed for their baptism. And as a display of their faith, they obliged. So the works of baptism followed faith. So it's about the order. Their previous faith led to expression through works. As Cornelius was said to be a good man and mentioned his works. And God looked upon them with approval expressed through gifts of the Spirit, which no doubt led to more faith expressed in the works of baptism. Yeah, like in James. Right. James chapter 2, I think it is. Exactly. And, and I think Abraham's in that as well. So let's read that. James okay. 2, as you mentioned. 14, I think. Okay. Of what benefit is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? That faith cannot save him, can it? If a brother or a sister is lacking clothing and enough food for the day, yet one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep keep warm and well fed, but you do not give them what they need for their body, of what benefit is it? So too, faith by itself without works is dead. Nevertheless, someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, do you? You are doing quite well, and yet the demons believe and shudder. But do you care to know, O oh, empty man, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father declared righteous by works after he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that his faith was active, along with his works, and his faith was perfected by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham put faith in Jehovah, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he came to be called Jehovah's friend. So faith led to works, but works don't buy the free gift through Jesus that we can't afford. Exactly. I always give the illustration of a, uh, a Lamborghini. I could, I could never afford it, perhaps. So I have a wealthy friend, and he gives it to me. And, and an appreciation of that gift, I take care of it. I, I, and, I, and I have to in order to show that appreciation. I need to take the keys from him. I need to go transfer title and get it registered and get insurance. And then maybe I need to read the owner's manual so I know how to care for it and wash it. Maybe I need to move the other car out of the garage and put that one in the garage so that it, and take care of the paint and wax it and do all these things to care for it. Read the owner's manual and drive it appropriately. All these different things that I need to do, oil changes and go on and on with all of the works that would show appreciation for the gift that was given me. So, as we read previously in 1 Peter 3, in verse 1, through faith we request to God a good conscience through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Baptism is just a display to show that. So it may seem extreme to consider that the bread and the wine actually become Jesus' flesh and blood, or that baptizing dead people saves them, but it serves to illustrate how far it can go when taking too literal a view of spiritual symbols. Really though, could we do the same thing with the symbols of the memorial? So with this in mind, let's read John 6, 53. 
So Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. So what's more important? the ritual works of eating Jesus' flesh and blood, or having faith in Jesus' sacrifice? Has the symbol become a veil more important than the spirit behind the symbol? Has the Holy Grail cup become more important than the covenant for a kingdom? Has the wine become more important than the blood Jesus spilled on our behalf? Moreover, has the spilled blood become more important than the perfect life he led that sanctified it? Has the bread become more important than discerning the body? Perhaps we need to consider Jesus' words at Matthew 23. Okay. This is 16. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is under obligation. Fools and blind ones, which in fact is greater, the gold or the temple that has sanctified the gold. Moreover, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is under obligation. Blind ones, which in fact is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11, 26 to 34. Jesus brought out there that the principle behind things is more important than some of the surface things that the Pharisees drew attention to. 26. For whenever you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the loaf or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty respecting the body and the blood of the Lord. First, let a man approve himself after scrutiny, and only then let him eat of the loaf and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment against himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and quite a few are sleeping in death. But if we would discern what we ourselves are, we would not be judged. However, when we are judged, we are disciplined by Jehovah, so that we may not become condemned with the world. Consequently, my brothers, when you come together to eat it, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it is not for judgment. But as for the remaining matters, I will put them in order when I get there. So again, as he says, as for the remaining matters, I'll put them in order when I get there. Mm -hmm. This was just a little thing to bump them back into place a little bit. <laughs> and we can see here, some people want to say, well, it was just about drunkenness. It was about, that's what it was about. Well, no, it wasn't about drunkenness. It was also about how they treated their brothers. And as the scripture said, discerning the body. It was much deeper than just these superficial things that he was talking about right there. Now, we're certainly not here to tell you what to do or not to do in timing or partaking in the memorial. As we've often said, you have your Bible. And John 17, 3 is certainly more important than some ritual. Maybe we can read that too. This means everlasting life. They're coming to know you, the only true God and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. So expressing an opinion is fine, but that's different than pushing your opinion on others. It's funny with food in the Bible. I mean, you'd think, eh, what's the big deal? It's just food. However, what caused Adam and Eve <laughs> to sin, leading to the whole situation we're in in the first place? Exactly. Uh, what was the manna? We see repeatedly food being used symbolically, just as with the Passover or the memorial. So it seems fitting in this regard to read Romans 14. In verse 13, we'll start. Okay. Therefore, let us not judge one another any longer, but rather be determined not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle before a brother. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Only where a man considers something to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if your brother is being offended because of food, 
You are no longer walking according to love. Do not by your food ruin that one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let the good news you do be spoken of as bad. For the kingdom of God does not mean eating and drinking, but means righteousness and peace and joy with Holy Spirit. For whoever slaves for Christ in this way is acceptable to God and has approval with men. So then let us pursue the things making for peace and the things that build one another up. Stop tearing down the work of God just for the sake of food. True, all things are clean, but it is detrimental for a man to eat when it will cause stumbling. It is best not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything over which your brother stumbles. That seems kind of fitting, doesn't it? That would it best not to take meat or drink wine. wine. And it's true that the context here was food sacrificed to idols. But principally speaking, when it comes to when or if you should partake, the next verse is extremely important to consider. 22. The faith that you have, keep it to yourself before God. Happy is the man who does not judge himself by what he approves. And 23 okay. really hits the point. But if he has doubts, he is already condemned if he eats because he does not eat based on faith. Indeed, everything that is not based on faith is sin. So you should be certain. Your faith is certain on what you should do there. Uh, let's read also 2 Corinthians in that regard, chapter 9, verse 7. Let each one do just as he is resolved in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And as far as telling others when or if they should partake, maybe we should consider Romans 14, 4. And once again, the context here is food. Mm -hmm. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for Jehovah can make him stand. Now, 1 Corinthians 8, 2 and 3. If anyone thinks he knows something, he does not yet know it as he should know it. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. We may be certain of something in our own minds, but somebody else may have a contrary argument that would explain something a little better. There's nothing wrong with discussing it, but to force it on someone else. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, do not judge anything before the due time until the Lord comes. He will bring the secret things of darkness to light and make known the intentions of the hearts, and then each one will receive his praise from God. <laughs> so, we encourage you to keep up your studies and to observe the memorial according to the faith that you have built by the knowledge you possess. So I hope you like this video. Um, we've been enjoying an early spring, like we mentioned a little earlier. Um, and I think we're going to put the vlog that we got a couple of scouts, international scouts. And so we're going to, I think, put that on the end of this, our, our little journey of getting those two little internationals. <laughs> Enjoy. Not used to this new camera. We're buying the scout today. I'm super excited. Okay, I gotta put Swiffer. Don't put her down on the ground. We're early. early. The wind's picked up, of course. Because the wind's gonna be so terrible. Look at this. I don't know what the heck that is, but it's some sort of a bird nest, it looks like. they've. Kind of like, I don't know what the heck that is. Would it be like an, I don't think it'd be eagle's nest. We do have some vultures around here. I don't know if they'd put something in that kind of a tree or not. like from this way I should go within the other side the sun is bright
It's like this. Yeah. It's like this. You want to trade? I'm not really good, that good about videoing things. Chad's really good at videoing things compared to me. Yep. Get ready to load this. I'm the one that always picks all the quirky car cars and pickups and things. We got this little Scout too, that little blue one. It's just a Scout too. <laughs>